The other day I was in this museum and you know what I found out? What? The first ever woman was named Lucy. Animal life on Earth goes back millions of years. The only living being that uses its brain better than us. This allows it to have an echolocation system that is more efficient than any sonar invented by mankind. But the dolphin did not invent the sonar. It developed it naturally. And it is going through time seems to be also the only real purpose of each of the cells in our bodies. To achieve that aim, the mass of the cells that make up earthworms and human beings has only two solutions, be immortal or to reproduce. And what to say about Darwin, whom everybody took for a fool when he put forth his theory of evolution. It's up to us to push the rules and laws and go from evolution to revolution. <laughs> I absorbed a large quantity of synthetic CPH4 that will allow me to use 100% of my cerebral capacity. So Australopithecines, best known, uh, pro probably best remembered from uh, the original discovery, the first discovery of an Australopithecus, and that was the discovery of Lucy in 1974. Australopithecus afarensis was discovered by Donald Johansson in Ethiopia in 1974. It was reported to be about uh, to be 40% complete, but you can see the original skeleton there, which was by no means even close to 40% complete. Apparently, the claim of 40% complete was by not including the bones of the feet and uh, hands into this number. Actually, it's closer to 20% complete. It was dated to be about 3 million years old, and it was claimed to be a biped, meaning to have walked upright. Biped, two feet quadruped walked on four feet a number of uh, reconstructions have been made you can see these in museums across the world this is a uh, australopithecus afarensis a reconstruction from the las vegas natural Muse natural history museum natural history museum so naturalism okay i want to emphasize this this point i don't know why every this is a rabbit trail for sure but natural history museums i just i for and even some creation museums are calling themselves natural history museums. Remember, a scientific community has adopted a position of naturalism. Okay? Naturalism. That's why we call our science, that's why we call it natural science. Natural science. Science based on naturalism. That's why we call our museums natural history museums. And is it based on naturalism, history based on naturalism. That's why we call that out there nature. nature. But I argue that's not nature. That's not natural out there. That is a result of a supernatural act of creation, a remarkable, beautiful, spectacular world created just for us. How could people not see it? That what we are experiencing here, this thing we call life, this world we find ourselves living on is wondrous. It's marvelous. Doesn't it just cry out that I was made special and perfect and beautiful just for you? <sighs> Natural History Museum. Uh, Lucy also came on tour at the Pacific Science Center a few years ago. I took my uh, apologetics class. I teach apologetics at the high school level, uh, at the college level, uh, class of Sunday school and all. I took my, uh, you can see me in the background right there, took my uh, apologetics class to see the Lucy exhibit when it came to the Pacific Science Center uh, back in 2009. And they actually had Lucy there. but. And, and uh, there was a reconstruction there, but well, a couple of observations I, I, re I note that uh, nowhere did they have the fully, at, by the time this exhibit went on tour, they had found a lot of other pieces of Australopithecus afarensis, but they didn't have a full reconstruction of everything that had been found. You, you can see these skeletal reconstructions where they, sh where they have two different colors mixed in there. You can see the pieces that were real and these are different colored 
to show the pieces that have been kind of filled in. But nowhere did they, did they have a full reconstruction of the skeleton, which I thought was very suspicious or telling. But another uh, thought, thing that I thought was very cool, that Ethiopian government uh, required, in order to take Lucy on, on a tour, which belongs to Ethiopia, in order to take it on a tour, they also forced them to include a, the history of Ethiopia as part of the exhibit, which was almost entirely the Christian history of Ethiopia. So he makes this uh, exhibit about Lucy. You go in and all about these enormous churches in Ethiopia and the history and all. I thought, well, I thought it was kind of cool. Another uh, reconstruction shown here. This is a reconstruction shown at the Living World exhibit in St. Louis at the St. Louis Zoo. And notice, the, in, in particular, I'll give you another look at the feet here, but it has very human-like hands and feet. And notice a very pensive gaze, too. As it ponders, maybe it's upcoming patent, pen, patent pending. I'm not sure what it's gazing at there. My fingers and toes of, of the models are straight. The hands and feet are clearly human-like. At the exhibit that came to Pacific Science Center, also very human-like hands and feet were there. This thing is very small. It's only you know, like a three, three foot tall, this kind of thing. The problem with it was by the time this exhibit was created and others, it was already known that Lucy did not have human-like hands and feet, that their hands and feet were very curved and very ape-like. Studies had already been done and shown this to be true. Uh, in 1983, uh, Jack Stern and Russell, uh, uh, Randall Sussman, paleontologists at the State University of New York at Stony Brook, uh, published some findings arguing that they had very ape-like hands and feet. Now, they believe that they are inter uh, transitional forms between apes and humans, but uh, they summarize it this way, that the morphological and functional affinities of the, of the hand fossil, they said, leads inexorably to an image of a suspensory adapted hand, one designed for hanging, surprisingly similar to the hands in the small end of the pygmy chimpanzee comp and chimpanzee range. So these are even closer to chimmy, pygmy chimpanzees than they are regular chimpanzees, and they continue. They say there is no evidence that any extant living primate has long, curved, heavily muscled hands and feet for any purpose other than to meet the demands of full or part-time arboreal life, life in the trees. Their shoulders were also much more suited for living in the trees, what we call brachiation, for swinging from branch to branch. The shoulder socket of afarensis is sharply angled, you'll see here. Humans are vertically oriented. This clearly indicates that they are arboreally adapted, adaptive for life in the trees. In 2000, it was reported that they had wrists capable of locking the hands in place during knuckle walking. Afrensis and Anamensis, later represented by the famous skeleton known as Lucy, had wrists capable of locking the hands in place during knuckle walking. This was reported in both Science News and the journal Nature under the title Lucy on the grounds with knuckles, that might require some explanation. The original name Lucy came, came from, according to reports, the night after its discovery, they were playing Beatles. And then the song Lucy on the Sky with Diamonds came on and someone had the bright idea to call their discovery Lucy. So Lucy on the ground with knuckles. There you get the, get the connection from there. Their pelvis bones were also very similar to chimps. Note, the iliac blade of humans goes back to front, whereas in apes, the iliac blades flare out laterally. The orientation, again, is significant for maintaining posture during bipedal motion. The uh, afarensis definitely had chimp-like hips. Stern and Sussman noted this as well. They say the fact that the anterior portion of the iliac blade faces laterally in humans but not in chimpanzees is obvious. The marked resemblance of Lucy to the chimpanzee is equally obvious. It suggests to us, they say, that the mechanism of lateral pelvic balance during bipedalism was closer to that in apes than in humans. They were definitely ape-like. But what do you do? If you have you an ape fossil and you want it to be a biped, but all evidence shows that it is a quadruped, it has a hip of a quadruped, and you want that thing to be a biped, what can you do? Well, one thing you can do is you can modify your fossil. You can take that fossil in the workroom, and you can hack apart pieces and glue that thing back together until you have you something that's going to walk, uh, walk upright. That's what you can do. Now, this may seem facetious, but uh, 
But this is exactly what one anthropologist did. <clears throat> uh, Owen Lovejoy, who is the chairman of anthropology at Kent State University, basically does this kind of reconstruction in a, uh, you can see this in a, in a PBS Nova series video from 1994 called In Search of Humans. Watch uh, what Do Owen Lovejoy does here. The ape that stood up, it was a revolutionary idea. We needed Owen Lovejoy's expertise again, because the evidence wasn't quite adding up. The knee looked human, but the shape of her hip didn't. Superficially, her hip resembled a chimpanzee's, which meant that Lucy couldn't possibly have walked like a modern human. But Lovejoy noticed something odd about the way the bones had been fossilized. When I put the two parts of the pelvis together that we had, this part of the pelvis has pressed so hard and so completely into this one that it caused it to be broken into a series of individual pieces which were then fused together. So he believes that the hip had been broken and then just fossilized back into its present form. So he decides to fix that. This has caused the two bones, in fact, to fit together so well that they're in an anatomically impossible position. The perfect fit was an illusion that made Lucy's hip bones seem to flare out like a chimp's. But all was not lost. Lovejoy decided he could restore the pelvis to its natural shape. He didn't want to tamper with the original, so he made a copy in plaster. He cut the damaged pieces out and put them back together the way they were before Lucy died. It was a tricky job, but after taking the kink out of the pelvis, it all fit together perfectly, like a three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. As a result, the angle of the hip looks nothing like a chimp's, but a lot like ours. Make the evidence fit your view, that's what you do, yeah. The skull of Lucy is also extremely ape-like. Notice the sloping shovel face of Lucy. That's typical of apes. The canine teeth are also, also coming in as an angle, <clears throat> excuse me, unlike humans, which come in more straight. The cranial capacity of, of afferents is, is, is even smaller than a typical ape. They don't have nasal bones, very ape-like. The jaw of Australopithecines is much, even, much similar to an, a chimp than humans. I'll note here. Also note the point of attachment of the spine, where the spine fits into the skull. I noted this previously, which uh, in humans, remember, they, it, it merges in the center, whereas in apes, it, it fits in the back. <clears throat> Australopithecines also had a semicircular canal, which, remember, is important for balance, similar to that uh, um, uh, possessed by chimps, and a large external ear hole like we see in apes. And the, many of these observations are not new. In fact, uh, renowned scientists have been arguing against Australopithecines as a human ancestor for decades. For example, uh, 1958, Ashley Montague, a British anthrop an American anthropologist <clears throat> who taught at Princeton, Rutgers, University of California, New York University, denied that Australopithecine was a human ancestor. He said the skull form of all Australopithecines is extremely ape-like. The Australopithecines show too many specialized and ape-like characteristics to be either the direct ancestor of man or of the line that led to man. 1970, Lord Zuckerman, a professor of anatomy at Birmingham University in uh, England and who was the chief scientific advisor to the British government said, I find myself totally unpersuaded. Almost always when I've tried to check the anatomical claims of which the status of Australopithecus is based, I've been in failure. The Australopithecine skull is in fact so overwhelmingly simian as opposed to human that the contrary proposition could be equated to an assertion that black is white. <clears throat> 